As we all adapt to a COVID-19 world, BMI Tampa would like to thank our chapter sponsors for their ongoing support of manager education. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nikki Osmer, and I'm an attorney at Appleton Reese. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the ins and outs of collections under Florida law. This is a pretty detailed course, and we're going to be discussing a lot of topics today. Um, if you would please use the Q&A so that uh, Carrie can read off the questions, and I would be happy to answer them in between slides or at the end of the presentation. Um, there's also going to be some uh, documentation that's going to be provided to everybody after the course, and I will explain those type of uh, documents that we're going to be submitting to you guys after this class. So without further ado, let's get started. This is a two-hour class, and I'm going to try my best to try and cut it down a little earlier, um, but there is a lot of information that we need to cover. So collecting past due assessments. One of the things that I always tell my managers the first time that they have a new association is that they have to review the declaration of the association. This is, obviously everyone knows, this is the constitution of the governing documents. And you're gonna get all of your information in regard to the recording of these documents and whether or not there are any late fees, whether you can charge interest, uh, when the default date will be, what's the grace period, and things of that nature. Um, also, take consideration of when these documents were incorporated, because you will not be able to take advantage of the new laws that have been implemented under Florida statute if your condominium documents are still uh, dated back from let's say the 1970s. I've seen associations with very old documents um, and that can be a problem when you are trying to collect past due assessments. Uh, for example, some of the issues that I see come up is uh, assessments that are past due become a personal obligation of the unit owner and that's in direct conflict with the statute where the statute says that the previous owner is going to be liable with the current owner for any past due assessments. So if the declaration or the bylaws provides that the association may charge a late fee, you can charge $25 or 5% of each delinquent installment. Um, at times I'm going to be discussing the difference between HOA and condos. Uh, there isn't much of a difference when it comes to collection of past due assessments. There's only a few differences, and I will hone in on those as well. Um, another issue that I also see with declarations that are outdated is that there is no interest rate. 
Um, sometimes I actually see interest rates that exceed the allowable uh, amount per year. Right now, what we can collect is 18% per year, um, and that's both under Florida Statute 718 and 720. So what happens when delinquents, when the assessments become delinquent? As I previously mentioned, owners are jointly and severally liable. And that means that if homeowner A transfers their deed to homeowner B and doesn't get an estoppel, if homeowner A is past due on their assessments, homeowner B is going to be responsible for all of them, even if they've only owned the property for one day. Um, so we have to take note and, and also be very careful when you are doing your estoppels and your payoffs and things of that nature. Um, if, if there is a new owner in place and there's past due assessments, you can collect from this new owner what the previous owner did not pay. So how do we secure our assessments? One of the reasons why I love practicing in this area of the law is because you can consider assessments to be a secured debt instead of an unsecured debt like credit cards. So secured debt means that you can file a lien against the property and that lien can be foreclosed on. So the lien would be recorded in the county where the property is located um, and you would be able to include late fees, any penalties, interest, and reasonable costs such as uh, attorney's fees and administrative costs. Um, I know some of the managers also charge what's called a collection fee. Uh, those collection fees can also be uh, placed on the lien because it is incident of trying to collect past due assessments. So what does the lien actually do? The lien puts a cloud on title and it obstructs the homeowner's ability to sell or refinance the home without becoming uh, current on their assessments. Now, this is one of the differences between HOAs and condos. When you send out your demand letters, uh, the demand letters have to be two, and then they have to be separated by 30 or 45 days. Condos are 30 days, HOAs are 45 days. So you're gonna send out your first letter, you have to wait 45 days before you can file your claim of lien. Once you file your claim of lien, then you'd have to wait 45 days to file your lawsuit. If you do not wait the statutory period, whether you're a condo with 30 days or whether you're an HOA with 45 days, if you jump the gun before that time period expires, you will waive your right to collect attorney's fees. Um, I had to learn that the very hard way. <laughs> um, but so make sure that you understand that the difference between the HOA and the condo are the time periods in which you can you send out your two letters and file a lawsuit. So Florida is a judicial state. And what that means is that you have to file a lawsuit and obtain a judgment in order for the association to foreclose on the property. Um, unlike states up north, they simply put a notice on your door and say, you need to be out in three days. So what happens if there is a mortgage foreclosure on the property? This uh, complicates just slightly for the association because you are going to take title to that property subject to a mortgage. And let's face it, anytime we have a delinquent homeowner who's not paying their assessments, nine out of 10 times they're not paying their mortgage either. So, It, there, it is an issue that the association is not responsible for the monthly mortgage payments because they did not sign the note, okay? So I just wanna make that very clear because I get a lot of questions from board members that, in, well, we don't wanna pay mortgage payments on a property that we own. You are not. And what are some of the other avenues that associations can do to recoup some of their assessments um, from a lien foreclosure? The, the typical timeline, and let me go back real one, one slide. 
Some of the other avenues that you can use to collect past due assessments are rent demand letters. Again, if a homeowner is not paying assessments, they're probably not paying their mortgage and they're pocketing all the rent from their tenant. You can intercept that money from the tenant and place yourself in the shoes of the landlord. If the tenant doesn't turn over the rent to pay for the past due assessments, then the association has the right to evict that tenant as if they were standing in the shoes of the landlord, which is our homeowner who is delinquent. So I like to put together this timeline so that everybody can see what the actual process is um, when it comes to lien foreclosures. Because I get a lot of clients sometimes that are always very anxious and they want to go back to got to get this done and quickly. Uh, we have to foreclose. We have to file a claim of lien, but it's not that easy. We have statutory guidelines that we need to follow as far as the timing is concerned. And again, this comes into play with the previous discussion we had on the 30 versus 45 days. So here is in a perfect world how it would work. And even in a perfect world, we're still looking at months in order to get a foreclosure completed. So if the unit owner becomes delinquent in January, the ledger should be sent either 30, 60, or 90 days after the uh, tenant, excuse me, the uh, homeowner is delinquent. And I had a previous question about that. When do we send it to the attorney? You can send it to the attorney at any time. It could be 30 days, it could be 60 days, or it could be 90 days delinquent. But I always advise my clients and management companies that they should not go beyond 90 days because you're going to be in a situation where it's going to be more difficult for you to collect those past due assessments, especially when there's a mortgage foreclosure involved. Um, so once the ledger is turned over to the attorney, the attorney prepares the first demand letter. And this demand letter says, you owe us X amount of dollars for these months that you haven't paid on your assessments. You have 30 or 45 days to pay those past due assessments. If you do not pay them, then we're going to file a lien against your house. 30 or 45 days goes by, and we're now in April. The second demand letter is being prepared and the claim of lien is recorded where you send a copy of the lien to the homeowner with the letter that says, if you do not pay these amounts within 30 or 45 days, depending on HOA or condo, we're going to foreclose on your unit or on your lot. Then another 40 or 35 days goes by and the association can now file their foreclosure action. Once the court issues a case number and issues all the summonses, we need to serve our owners. Now, this is where some of the delays may come in. An owner has 20 days to respond to a lawsuit. Sometimes the homeowners are dodging service or we can't find them. Uh, possibly the homeowner died and they have no heirs or next of kin uh, who wants to take responsibility for the unit. So if nobody responds to the complaint, we go ahead and have the clerk of court for whatever county you're in issue a default against the unit owner. If that happens, then you can move straight to summary judgment. You'll probably get a hearing within 30 or four, um, 60 days, depending on the judge's calendar. And again, the attorneys have no control over that. Summary judgment is granted. The judge sets a sale date probably within about 30 days. And then if there are no objections to the sale held within 10 days of the sale, then the clerk will issue a certificate of title. However, if between the sale date and the issuance of the certificate of title, there is an objection filed, everything stops until the objection can be heard by a judge. And then if the judge denies the request, the clerk will issue the title to the association. You may have some squatters that are in the unit, and if necessary, you would have to file for a writ of possession where the sheriff would go out, place a notice on the door, and say, you've got three days to get out, or all your stuff is going to be on the curbside. Is it worth it to file a foreclosure? Now, I always tell my... Uh, 
board members, do you know what the condition of the property is in? If, if you don't know it, we're playing a gambling game here because you may have a property that you foreclose on and it's not a rental for the association. Um, so I would always be cautious about that and see if you can at least peek into the windows or uh, gain access to the property to see if it needs repairs, if it's been vandalized, um, you know, and what kind of repairs does it need? There may be mold in there. Um, and I've even seen some homeowners who are just closed on and they rip out all the kitchen cabinets, they rip take out all the appliances. So um, look to see if it's a viable rental. And if not, um, if it is, excuse me, then you can rent out the unit. Make sure that you look at the governing documents of the association just to confirm that renting is allowed in your community because you may have a provision in your declaration that says no one can rent uh, or rent their units in the community. And that would also apply to the association unless you had a, an exception that was carved out in your declaration. So remember that the declaration is very important. And if it's outdated and it doesn't have the current laws in there, you're going to be missing out on some of the very good um, changes that have been made over the years to assist homeowners associations and condo associations with collecting their past due assessments. So we talked earlier about intercepting rent uh, money from tenants and Florida statute 718-116-11A allows the association to demand that the tenant make lease payments directly to the association. What happens if the tenant doesn't pay? Um, the collection policy should specify when the association garnish or process for doing so. And what is a collection policy? I always recommend to my clients that they implement a resolution or a sort of collection policy that will apply to everyone across the board. Um, I will be providing you with a copy of a collection policy that I drafted uh, for this purpose after the past so that you can see um, how it's structured and what it entails. Um, it basically is putting the entire community on notice that 30 days, if you don't pay, you're going to get a friendly reminder from management. If you don't pay within the 30 days, 60 days goes by, it's going to go to the attorney. Because I have a lot of homeowners that are complaining, what, you sent me to collections and I'm only 60 days behind? Well, that's what it says in the collection policy and everyone is treated the same. So there won't be any selective enforcement arguments if you know you, you foreclose or you send the homeowner to collections either 60 days after the delinquency, 90 days um, after the delinquency, or even 120 days. I have some associations that only have quarterly assessments and they're about $150 a quarter. Um, so instead of sending them to collection for just one past due quarterly assessments, they wait until two quarters or 120 days have gone by. So the collection policy will also specify when the association can begin eviction proceedings. So if you have an owner who is not paying, but they are renting out the unit, you may send a rent demand letter to them, uh, to the tenant, indicating that if the tenant does not turn over rents, that they will be in a position where the association can evict them. There is some argument that Disclosing to the tenant that the owner is past due on assessments may violate the uh, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Um, be very careful when you're, if you're doing that, I would only suggest that you allow the attorneys to do those letters um, because you cannot disclose how much is owed. Um, it has to be a very generic letter. Receiverships. So remember when the law has changed um, about three or four years ago for receiverships, and they were very lucrative to begin with. Um, I, I had some experiences with receiverships. Um, they were very efficient at times, and then other times if the property was not um, well-maintained or had some issues, um, they may not take it over. So again, 
these receivers are also going to look at the properties to see whether or not they're a viable rental because they're going to be renting out these uh, properties until the bank forecloses. Um, and during that time frame, the receiver would be paying all of the assessments to the association. Carrie, do we have any questions? Okay. So back in the day, bank foreclosures in Florida were exceeding any other state in the United States. Florida was the second leading state and the recent statistics from 2018 show that it was 47.2% were in pre-foreclosure pre status and they were increasing by 67.9%. Right now I read in the um, times that the foreclosures have actually been at a record low recently, but I think that's probably gonna be changing as soon as the COVID-19 executive order for the moratorium on mortgage foreclosures is lifted. Um, that keeps getting extended by the governor and it has affected some lien foreclosures because some judges are taking it as a package deal, meaning mortgage foreclosures and lien foreclosures are the same thing and they're not. Uh, so we have some judges in certain counties that are allowing us to proceed with lien foreclosures um, and some others that will not. Remember that a bank foreclosure is gonna take anywhere from six months to a year to complete. So you should have a strategy in place that you are going to try and uh, collect on these past due assessments before the bank takes over because the bank is only required to pay what's called safe harbor. I think we have some comments. No, that's just me. I'm sending, I keep forgetting I'm on mute. Um, I'm sending them some information if they have not registered with their license number to make sure we have it. So that's what I you're I have a, a question from Gail. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. The Q and A on the, on, the, on the Zoom app, it says, if the association takes title to the home and can rent it, they can also place it up for sale provided that the collection covers the existing mortgage. I wouldn't do that. Um, you need to put what's a provision in your lease that discloses to, and this is just my personal um, recommendation. I would always disclose to the unit, uh, to the tenant that the mortgage is still subject to the property and that uh, it could be foreclosed on by the bank at any time. Uh, so they're not taken out left field when they say, oh my goodness, I have a year lease and I've only been in here six months and now the bank is foreclosing. So I don't think that the bank is going to really give the association any leeway as far as payment of mortgages or collecting existing mortgage payments um, because they just want to turn over their bad debt and get it off the books. Um, okay. So what are some things that the association can do to speed up bank foreclosures? Because remember, they do take a long time. I mean, I remember back in the day when foreclosures would take up to two years and people were living in their home for two years, not paying a mortgage payment, and of course, not paying any assessments. So any lien holder, and when I say lien holder, that includes the association because they have a claim of lien filed against the property. Um, can request the court to expedite the foreclosure case. Um, and I've seen this done and I've used this method a lot as well. Um, it's called an order to show cause. And it's the entry of a final judgment under Florida statute 702.10. This permits the foreclosing party to request a final judgment of the foreclosure without summary judgment hearing. Basically what the homeowner needs to do is come to the court and say, Judge, I have these defenses and you should not allow a final judgment. If the defendant and homeowner come forward with any type of defenses, the order to show cause 
and the final judgment will not be issued. Other ways to speed up the foreclosure is set the case for trial. Um, a lot of these foreclosure uh, law firms, we call them foreclosure mills. They have way too much time or too many filings that getting it through the court system is problematic because there's so much volume. Another thing that you could do is schedule a case management conference and alert the judge, judge, you know, this foreclosure has taken over a year and our association has not been paid assessments. We need to collect assessments on this unit so we can pay our bills. Remember to contact an experienced attorney to assist the association in order to use these strips. Um, I think I have uh, another question. Nope. Okay. So what happens after the bank takes title? Now, remember the association is entitled to collect back owed maintenance fees from the foreclosing bank, but the question is how much? And this is going to be applicable in both HOAs and condominiums. And I'm sure everyone has heard of Safe Harbor. So the way the statute reads is right here. And I'm going to break it down in cliff notes for you guys. If you have a bank that forecloses on a unit and they are the original mortgagee on that property, meaning they're the ones that issued the loan, they're entitled to a cap on the amount of assessments that they're required to pay to the association. And that would be either 12 months immediately preceding the acquisition of title or 1% of the original mortgage debt. So normally the 12 months is always gonna be larger. Uh, let's say for example, we have a condominium that has monthly assessments and their monthly assessments are $450 a month, but you have a unit that only has a mortgage on it for $75,000. So if it's 12 months or 1%, you always have to go by what is the lesser amount. And that is the amount that would be obligated by the bank to pay the association. So at the beginning of the class, when I was saying it's very important to not let these delinquencies get too far down the line. And that's why implementing a, a collection policy is very important so that you can streamline this process and make sure that you are collecting assessments if they become 60 days past due or 90 days past due. You don't wanna get into a situation where property's in a mortgage foreclosure and you haven't collected any assessments in over a year or maybe two years. So one thing also I wanted to remind everyone is when you're preparing your estoppels, be very careful. If you do not have an owner who is past due on assessments, but they are past due on uh, their mortgage in either situation, but this is normally how it would happen, you cannot put any attorney's fees, any late fees, no interest and no co costs on that estoppel. It is basically the date they took title and you're either 12 months or 1% of the mortgage and that's it. You can't not put on the attorney's fees that the association paid during that time or all the late fees or all the interest that accrued during the bank foreclosure. So various district courts have ruled that these add-on charges such as late fees, collection fees, interest, and attorney's fees are not collectible from the first mortgagee that obtained title as a result of a foreclosure or a deed in lieu of foreclosure. Um, a deed in lieu of foreclosure is basically considered cash for keys. The bank offers the homeowner uh, cash for keys or they say, listen, if you title the uh, property over to the bank again, we will waive all of the delinquency on this mortgage. And either way, which, whichever it is, either a foreclosure or a deed in lieu of foreclosure, uh, the bank will still have 
the ability to collect on um, safe harbor amounts. Some of the other uh, details relating to safe harbor is when the bank is going to file a mortgage foreclosure, if they're going to be entitled to safe harbor, they must name the association as a defendant in the underlying foreclosure case. I have actually seen banks dismiss cases and start over so that they don't have to pay the association the full amount of the assessments um, under safe harbor because they did not or they failed to put in the association the case as a defendant. Um, another issue is being able to prove that you're the original mortgage holder or that you are a bona fide successor assignee. So everybody knows that, you know, mortgages and loans, they get bought and sold several times and they're transferred to other lenders uh, or other investors. And you have to be able to prove that you are a bona fide successor assignee. And what that means is, is that you can trace the chain of title through um, the mortgage to show who was the assignee and the assignor through all of those uh, assignment of mortgages. One case in particular that uh, made a lot of uh, noise was Ocean Bank versus Caribbean Towers. And they had two estoppels that were due. And one of the estoppels was nine times the statutory maximum amount. Um, they were requesting $8,835. And then on the second estoppel, they were requesting $20,233 which was 13 times more than the statutory maximum. The trial court ruled in favor of Ocean Bank on the merits, meaning that safe harbor was to be applied, and the court actually called the association's lawsuit frivolous um, because it is very clear from the statute that if a bank is going to be paying the safe harbor amounts, they cannot, or the association cannot charge interest, late fees, collection costs, or attorney's fees. Um, third DCA ruled that the bank was entitled to an award of attorney's fees, and guess how much that attorney fee award was? It was in thirty-five dollars to $40,000 in attorney's fees that the association had to pay. So again, be very careful if you are preparing estoppels for your association, and it is a bank foreclosure, that you do not charge anything else besides the 1% or 12 months, whichever is less. Another case uh, which was actually uh, good for the association was Federal National Mortgage Association versus Park Place at Pompano Condominium. This was a situation where uh, Fannie Mae bought the loan and had been a signee of the first mortgage right to bid at the foreclosure sale. So I'm not sure if you guys have seen uh, some loan documentation when they come through that you have either an assignment of mortgage or you just have a right to bid. And sometimes what the banks will do if it's a federally funded loan that they will assign uh, Fannie Mae their rights to bid at the foreclosure sale, meaning that they stand in the shoes of the original mortgagee. An actual assignment of mortgage has to be executed in order for Fannie Mae to be considered an assignee of the first mortgagee and to receive the safe harbor protections. Just because you've been assigned a right to bid at the foreclosure sale does not mean that you are a bona fide assignee of the mortgage. The key word is mortgage. It's not the bid, it's not assignment of the foreclosure judgment, it is an assignment of the mortgage. And remember that it's titled through the uh, mortgage where you are going to be able to determine who's the assigner and who's the assignee and whether or not that chain of title has been broken. So back in 2017, the estoppel bill was passed and it revamped the entire estoppel, estoppel certificate process and what needed to be contained um, in the estoppel process. The certificate 
um, that's completed by the association um, has to contain specific information regarding the unit, how much assessments are owed, and whether or not uh, they're past due, whether they're in litigation, um, and the association should also consider policies limiting, limiting who is authorized to provide such information. Because if you have too many people preparing estoppels, they may not prepare them correctly and you could find yourself in a lawsuit. So if an estoppel certificate is delivered by email, it must be effective for 30 days. And if the estoppel is delivered by regular mail, then it must be effective for 35 days. An estoppel certificate may be amended during the validity period if a mistake was made. Um, you cannot charge any additional fees if you have to amend your estoppel certificate. Um, and the applicable statute is 718.116, subsection 8B is in boy. So in 2017, when the new law had passed for estoppels, the uh, legislation had indicated that a form resolution had to be adopted by the board. I still know um, some of the associations have not done this, and if it hasn't been done, they should do it. Uh, the association website has to identify the name of the person or the entity de designated to receive estoppel letter requests uh, with their mailing address or email address for receipt. You should also designate a specific email address, whether it be condobuilding1 at gmail.com or condobuilding1 estoppels at gmail.com. And as to attorney charges, the resolution can also indicate that the attorney's fees charged to the association will apply up to the maximum allowed per minute by law. Before, you could not charge fees up front uh, prior to closing. And this required that the association and the attorneys prepare all these certificates without being paid. So now you can charge an upfront fee. And if the sale is canceled, then you have to refund that money back to the uh, homeowner or the title company. And you can put that estoppel fee on the ledger of the uh, homeowner. Which fees can you charge? So the association can charge $250 for preparing and delivering the estoppel certificate. If the homeowner is delinquent, you can add an additional $150. And if the estoppel certificate request is an emergency or it needs to be done in an expedited manner, it has to be delivered within three days after the request. Um, and you can charge on top of that an additional fee. So when I get an estoppel, it's always going to be delinquent because we only handle the, the delinquent account. So attorneys can charge the 250, the 150, and the 100 on top of that if they have an expedited request. So we're looking at uh, about a $500 fee um, and, and lower if it's not expedited. I have another question. Would fees for condo questionnaires have to be refunded if the sale doesn't close? Um, that's an interesting question and does not, it's not addressed in the estoppels. I would think so um, because the, uh, are we talking about an application? Let's see. Okay, so it's not an application. Um, and we're talking about just the questionnaire itself, correct? Okay. Kathy, um, un unmuted you if you want to speak. Okay. I'm sorry, say I, that again, Carrie. She, she unmuted me. Um, oh, so well. Thanks, the Kathy. Banks, the banks will ask for a questionnaire to be completed, and we charge $150 for that, which I believe is, is legal. And uh, I just wondered if the sale does not go through, does that questionnaire money need to go back? Uh, uh, 
not related I'm going to err on the other side of caution and say yes. Um, the, um, the questionnaire is separate and I, and I would think that that fee is in your management agreement. And if it is, then I think you'd be okay with, with the charge. Um, so as far as the estoppel uh, request or certificates are concerned, if you have any other charges, and it may be non-refundable if the board has a resolution that's passed on a certain subject, um, you know, for example, the application fee, that's non-refundable. Um, but these questionnaires, uh, it would, it would probably be um, refundable, I would think, because it's not the same as the application because you're actually running the background checks and you're incurring costs um, as far as the background checks are concerned. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. If someone other than the owner pays for the estoppel certificate and the salary is have a procedure in place on how to get your estoppels or how they are to be requested. Use the designated email, post it on the website um, so that you're not in a position where you've had this estoppel request laying around for more than 10 days and uh, didn't know about it and now you can't charge fees on your certificate preparation. So what needs to be in the estoppel certificate? You have to put in, again, all past due assessments, whether or not there are any fines that have been charged against the homeowner, whether or not there are any violations on property. You have to put in the insurance information of the association, all insurance information for multiple policies, and whether or not that it is a sub-association. And if it's a sub-association, whether there is a master association, and you have to put the contact information for that sub-association or master association. Bankruptcies. And a lot of times managers and board members believe that when you have a homeowner that files for bankruptcy, all bets are off and that you can't collect anything. That is not the case. Um, it depends on the type of bankruptcy case that has been filed. Now there are uh, various different chapters that can be filed, but for our purposes, we're looking primarily at a chapter seven, a chapter 13, or a chapter 11. A chapter seven is a complete wipeout of all your debt. You basically don't have any assets, and if you do, those assets are gonna be liquidated to pay your debt. But chapter seven is the quickest um, bankruptcy, and it's usually completed within uh, three to five months. A chapter 13 is different. It, it's kind of like a reorganization of personal debt, and you have the opportunity to strip off junior liens, such as your liens from your assessments, um, any second mortgages. You can cram down notes on vehicles. This is a five-year plan, three to five-year plan in a chapter 13. And the owner is required or the association is required to file what's called a proof of claim in a chapter 13 or chapter 11 so that they can get paid on the amounts that are owed. One of the things that you want to look at also is, and of course this, is, this should be handled by the attorney, I'm not expecting any of the managers to go through any paper or work for bankruptcies, but for your own information, uh, you want to know whether or not the person is actually keeping the property. And you will see that in a chapter seven and 13 as far as um, whether they're going to surrender it back to the bank. Okay. 
And surrendering it back to the bank means that there is no automatic stay, which is what we're gonna talk about next. But once that homeowner makes the decision that they're not gonna keep the home and that when the bank finally forecloses, they're off the hook, um, you wanna, the automatic stay will not apply. So you are free to collect those assessments that come to you after the bankruptcy, but not before. So remember that there is a fine line that's drawn in the sand, and that line represents the date that the bankruptcy was filed. Anything previous to the date of filing, you can't collect anymore. So don't try it because it would be a violation of the automatic stay. From the date of the bankruptcy moving forward, you can collect those fees and those assessments, okay? Because it is title not debt that makes the homeowner responsible for these assessments. So remember, there's two different things. You have debt and you have title. Title to the property means that you are obligated to pay those assessments. And that doesn't go away if you have a discharge in bankruptcy court. Um, so just wanted to give that information to the managers because there's usually a cloud of doubt when it comes to bankruptcies and whether or not the associations have the right to collect after the bankruptcy is filed and the answer is yes. So let's talk about the automatic stay because one of the things that we as creditors uh, want to be very mindful of is the fact that there is an automatic stay in place and what that means is that all collection efforts must stop. Um, you cannot send any letters you cannot contact the debtor. Um, and if you do or attempt to collect the debt that is under the bankruptcy protection, you could be sanctioned by the federal judge. And these sanctions um, could be a few thousand dollars, but the most critical portion of that is attorney's fees. So the debtor's counsel is gonna be salivating over the fact that you sent a collection letter or a reminder of a past due debt that's covered by the bankruptcy case, and they're gonna file a motion for sanctions against you um, and the management company or the association for sending out that collection letter or that statement or that ledger or whatever it is. So just be mindful. Once you get that bankruptcy paperwork, do not send the homeowner anything, put uh, the file on hold, and make sure that whatever internal processes that you have indicate that this homeowner is in bankruptcy and that you cannot collect the debt. We have another question. And this is from Danielle. Um, do you have to disclose possible upcoming special assessments on an estoppel? Um, there is also a place for that in the estoppel. And your estoppels can look like whatever you want. They just need to contain all the information. Um, if there is a special assessment that's going to be passed, but hasn't been passed yet, you do not need to put it on there, okay? But if it's already been passed and it's being paid off, um, then yes, you do. Okay, so we went through our chapter seven, and again, it's a liquidation of all your debt. You get a complete discharge of all your debt, including deficiencies and judgments. Um, the lien is still valid. Lenders can continue to foreclose um, if the debtor is surrendering the property. Associations should be aware that even after surrendering a property, again, like we discussed, the owner will still be liable for ongoing assessments, and they have to pay. I remember getting uh, a scathing letter from a bankruptcy attorney one time, and he said he was going to file sanctions against me, and, and uh, he was in violation of the automatic stay because I sent him a letter trying to collect the assessments that had occurred since the date he filed moving forward. And I very clearly showed him the statute and uh, never heard from him again. <laughs> But um, in those situations, just be very, very careful. Um, and I wouldn't expect any of the managers to make that call. I would just leave it up to the attorney so that there isn't any um, type of allegations of uh, misconduct. 
Um, okay, so we discussed chapter 13s and what you can do in a chapter 13. Again, you can strip off second mortgages that are wholly unsecured, meaning if you have a property that's worth $100,000 and you have a mortgage that's $120,000 and a second mortgage that's $30,000, that is wholly unsecured. Not a single penny can secure that mortgage, that second mortgage, or else you have to pay the entire amount. Um, other good features are cramming down mortgages on investment properties, and you can do that for full first mortgages as long as they are investment properties. Um, the chapter 11 is a reorganization business debt, um, and this is also used by investors who have multiple properties in an association or just multiple properties in various communities um, where they're upside down on their first mortgages. They strip off the association's lien and they cram down the first mortgage to the fair market value of what the property is. Okay, so when we discuss filing your proof of claim, remember that proof of claims are not normally filed in a chapter seven unless the trustee has um, seized assets and they're selling assets off to pay for debt. That's when you would be triggered to file your claim. And basically you're filling out a form from the bankruptcy court and attaching a ledger to it so that the bankruptcy court can see proof of what's owed. Um, normally the attorney representing the association will prepare that proof of claim um, and include all of the interest, late fees, and attorney's fees that have been incurred before the bankruptcy was filed. And I don't want people to get confused. Remember, safe harbor and bankruptcies are different, okay? When you're dealing with bankruptcies, you're in federal court. And we're dealing with safe harbor, we're dealing with state court laws. And there is a big difference. The uh, failure to timely file a proof of claim may result in the association's claim being disallowed by the court. Um, meaning, if you don't file within the deadline, you've lost your, your ability to collect from the homeowner if the homeowner has money to pay a portion of his debt. Managers should be cautious to send collection letters when a homeowner who has filed bankruptcy a community association may still enforce its lien against the property, but it's only in rem. What, what in rem means is that you are allowed to foreclose on the house to take title out of the name of the homeowner and into the association. You would not be able to collect on a judgment, okay? So completing your foreclosure to change title is very different than collecting on the debt that's been discharged from the bankruptcy. Again, title and debt are two different things. Don't commingle those things because people sometimes believe that they are one and the same and they are not. Do we have any questions? Do you, got, you want me to unmute everybody and see if we can? Yes, please. You guys are still going to have to unmute yourself on your end. Sorry, I'm going to unmute everyone. Go ahead. Okay. You don't have to, but. Yes, please cut me on that as well, please. Thank you. No problem. Bye bye. Anybody else? Anybody have any questions or anything? Hello? Hi, who's this? Christina Castillo. Hi, Christina. How are you? Well, great. I just, I received a message via the chat, but I don't know how to respond. Say that again. You have what? I received the oh. message via chat, but I have no idea how to respond. Oh, okay. Where do I send the info to? Hang on. I'm doing it right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I have a question. Go ahead. Who's this? This is Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Go ahead with your question. And I'm going back to the estoppel portion. Sure. Because I have a community that's getting ready to do a special assessment on, for painting. My concern is, is, let's say I get an estoppel and the, uh, the special assessment has not passed and we don't put it on there, but before they can close, because closings get pushed out sometimes, it does pass. Do we have to remember to go back to that estoppel to change that? Or is that up to the title company to, to follow through with that? Um, to change it, so to put the, are you saying in between the, the, the time period for closing and then the special assessment has passed and you have to make a correction to the estoppel? Correct, would that be up to the title company to get a to get it revised or no that, that would actually be your office if your office was creating the estoppel and i would contact the title company quickly so that they don't close with the uh old estoppel and, and that's what i normally do i'll pick up the phone and i'll call them and tell them hey we have an amended estoppel that's coming over um just giving you a heads up you know when your closing date because closing okay. Closings happen and they sometimes don't. So you want to be assured that if you do have a, uh, a situation like that, that you do amend it. Because remember, if you don't amend it and you don't include the special assessments, then they're not obligated to pay them. Correct, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, I have one on that same kind of topic. This is Jamie Bryan. So then wouldn't you think that it would be beneficial to disclose in the estoppel that um, communications are being had regarding having a special assessment, even if it hasn't passed yet? Wouldn't it be wise to let, you know, the potential buyer know that it's in discussion? Yes. Um, again, this is in situations, though, that you may not pass the special assessment for some time. But if you know that it's imminent and it's coming and it's already been scheduled, then I would do that. I would put it on there that there is a special assessment that's gonna be coming due. You know, when it comes to estoppels, I disclose everything that I possibly can. I don't leave out any information because you don't wanna be accused of misrepresentation. Nikki, do you wanna pull up your um, PowerPoint and just kind of sure. go through each page and see if anybody wants to talk about anything specific as far as questions go? Hang on. Which, which portion? I was just saying, if you want to like skim through each page, see if there's anybody that has a question on specific topics that you've gone over, because you've gone over so much. Okay, hang on one second. Let's start from the beginning. Time. If anybody needs this timeline, I can actually also produce this with the handouts that we're going to be providing to you. So remember the, the, like that. And the collection. Yeah, that would be great. Yes. So, um, and you're also going to get a copy of this PowerPoint presentation as well. Yeah, okay. thank you. Okay, so you'll have all this information um, and you'll also have a copy of the collection policy that I drafted. We also record these webinars and we'll be posting this webinar on our website so that if you guys would like to allow your board members to um, watch the webinar, you can do so. I'll be getting that up on the website hopefully by the end of the day. Thank you. Oh, I have another question. Hang on. <laughs> Thanks, Denise. <laughs> she said, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> I opened up a poll for everybody. If you would please complete that before you log out today. And Nikki, did you have any closing statements? 
um, just to, there's a lot of information that we covered today and I um, hope I didn't overwhelm everybody, um, but take the uh, PowerPoint presentation and as cliff notes. Um, and of course, if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to answer any questions that people may have on this presentation. Nikki's email and information will be included in the PowerPoint that I email you guys later today. Well, I guess that is it. So I want to thank you, Nikki, for presenting today. You've been so helpful and informative. And I'm going to close this out with my little commercial. If it just last last call for questions, you guys. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys have a wonderful week. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Thank you. As we all adapt to a COVID-19 world, BMI Tampa would like to thank our chapter sponsors for their ongoing support of manager education.